The, uh, the title of the message this, this afternoon or this evening is uh, Rejoice in as much as. Rejoice in as much as. And, the, and it's based right there on 1 Peter. And we'll, we'll have to, we have to start in 1 Peter 4.12 to get the context. And we're going to go down to 14. But it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice... Inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God rested upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. And so the reason I chose the title Rejoicing As Much As is if you do a study on the word rejoice or rejoicing, rejoiced, Rejoiceth, you know, there's a lot of, there's actually hundreds of verses that talk about rejoicing. You know, it's one of the things that the Bible constantly is uh, drilling home that we should be happy of certain things or we should be exceedingly happy or joyful rejoicing in certain things. But the reason that I like rejoice in as much as is if you look at that terminology in as much as is saying seeing that or since or because to the extent thereof or for which cause. In other words, to the extent that if we go to verse 1 Peter 4.13, it says, But rejoice in as much as, or to the extent thereof, as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. In other words, you've partaken, or to that extent that you are in His suffering, or to the cause that you are suffering. The Bible says that when we suffer for Christ's sake, we should rejoice. And so today, you know, I mean, we could, this is a long study, but I just kept it real short and simple, and I came up with five things that we, we should rejoice in as much as. And we're going to end on that final point, on the focus of 1 Peter 4.13. But the reason that I picked these five is because it's a build up to how do you partake in Christ's suffering? What is it that is required of you to be partakers? And obviously we're talking to those that are saved by grace, that have that faith in Jesus Christ. That's always the first step in anything that we're learning biblically. In other words, to get any good doctrine, to grow in Christ, to grow in the Word, to grow in our prayer life, to grow in our soul winning uh, presentation, to grow in the fruits and the, the, spirit, uh, you know, the fruits of the Spirit, obviously salvation is the foundation. Without Jesus Christ as our cornerstone, then everything we do is in vain. It's fruitless. But the first point that I want to make to you today is rejoice in as much as the Lord's goodness is towards us. The Lord has goodness towards us. And if you'll turn there to Exodus 18, turn to Exodus 18. And while you turn there to Exodus 18, I'll read for you uh, 2 Thessalonians 1. It says, Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ and so it says here that and fulfill the good pleasure of his goodness you know that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill you uh, uh, and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. So it's talking about work and calling and fulfilling, and it's that goodness that God gives you. But how does that work? Well, if you go to Exodus 18 and we go to verse 1, uh, we see here that Moses had led the people, has led the people out of, the, out of Egypt. He's crossed the Red Sea. Now they're in the wilderness. And we come here to Exodus 18 and we see Jethro, who's uh, uh, Moses' father in law. Let's just start reading there. It says, When Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, and that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back and her two sons, of which the name of one was Gershom. For he said, I have been an alien in a strange land. And in the name of the other was Eliezer, for the God of my father said he was mine help and delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife unto Moses into the wilderness where he encamped at the mount of God. And he said unto Moses, I, thy father-in-law, Jethro, am come unto thee, and thy wife and her two sons with her. And Moses went out to meet his father-in-law and did obeisance and kissed him. 
and they asked each other of their welfare, and they came into the tent. And Moses told his, fa told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all the travail, and I want you to remember that when we come back later towards the end of the, uh, of the sermon, and it says, and all the travail that had come up, up, had come upon them by the way, and how the Lord delivered them. So we see already the suffering, the reproach, the trial and the tribulation from First Peter. It says, all the travail that had come upon them by the way, and how the Lord delivered them. And Jethro rejoiced for all the goodness which the Lord had done unto Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. So Jethro rejoiced in all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel after the delivery from the Egyptians. Well, there was trials, there was persecution. And as you know, even the Pharaoh and, and the, the sorcerers, uh, the, the men of Pharaoh, you know, they, they mocked. And they would play with, uh, they would toy with Moses' emotions. You know, I'll let the people go. I won't. You know, they, you, I, we, if you can make serpents, we can make serpents. You know, we see the seven plagues and I'm not going to go through all that. Like, go to verse 10. It says, And Jethro, blessed be, be the Lord who hath delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who hath delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. For in this thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above them. So Jethro has this moment where all of a sudden he realizes that, you know, he's dealing with the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And what he see, says here is that he is rejoicing or he's exceedingly glad or, or he's beyond joyful of all the goodness which the Lord had done to Israel. Now, God did goodness for Israel, but it wasn't until they went through the trial until they had to travail, until they had the tribulation. It wasn't this immediate thing. And so we need to rejoice in as much as the Lord's goodness is toward us. So how do we get the Lord's goodness? Well, we have to be willing to subject ourselves to the word of God and to the commandments and to the, the will that he has for us. And our will is to do the, the Great Commission, right? Is to go out there and preach the word uh, without filter, uncensored, you know, in the word of God, of course. You know, the world uses censorship for for, uh, you know, in, in other terms. But for us, the world is trying to censor the word of God, but we can't get all his goodness. We can't rejoice in all his goodness if we're constantly filtering the word of God to what people want to hear. If we're constantly uh, mitigating the work or, or diluting the work in, in such a way that it won't offend individuals. You know, when you, we go out soul winning, there's times when we have to tell people, look, it's, I think it's a good opportunity for you to give us uh, a chance to speak to you for five to ten minutes because based on your response, you're going to hell for all eternity. This is an eternal thing, you know, and, and you don't know how people are going to respond. There's times when people are just like they blow you off or they tell you no. Then there's times when people are just, you know, aggressive and they're going to attack you and they might even call the authorities and they might come after you and they might besmirch your name or reproach you, but you do it regardless so that you can rejoice in as much as the Lord has goodness toward us. You know, so point number one is we have to rejoice so much in as much as the Lord's goodness is toward us. But there's a, a formula or a specific set of ways that we get the Lord's goodness. Obviously, we're all saved by grace, uh, but we don't all get his goodness if we're not partaking in those in the travail, in the tribulation. You know, second point is rejoice in as much as ye put your hand unto. And, and go to there to Deuteronomy 12. Go to Deuteronomy 12. And then we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 10. So go to Deuteronomy uh, 12. And we're going to be there in verse 1. And, and we're going to cover a lot of scripture. And, you know, I did this purposely because, well, number one, we should always cover a lot of scripture. One of the things that that, uh, you know, I made a purpose. This is a side note. You know, I don't know why I'm doing it now or later, but uh, when I preach my messages, I want to make sure that I include a lot of God's word because the purpose of a preacher is to preach God's word. It's not to get up here so that you get accolades or respect or people think you're a good orator or not. As a matter of fact, that has nothing to do with preaching God's word. The purpose of someone is just to want to stand in the gap and be willing to tell uh, the truth 
based on God's word. Not tell it how it is, tell it how it is in God's word. And so you see here in Deuteronomy 12, verse 1, it says, These are the statutes and judgments which ye shall observe to do in the land which the Lord God of thy fathers giveth thee to possess in all the days that ye live on the earth. Ye shall utterly destroy the places wherein the nations which ye shall possess serve their gods upon the high mountains and upon the hills and under every green tree. And ye shall overthrow their altars and break their pillars and burn their groves with fire. And ye shall, ye shall hew down the graven images of their gods and destroy the name of them out of that place. Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God. Ye shall not do so unto the Lord your God, but unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all the tribes that put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and, th and thither thou shalt come. And let me just stop right there. You know, these first set of rules, obviously he's talking to them as they're going to go in, and they, they're supposed to destroy the land, and they're supposed to do these things. But for us, you know, as a, as a people of God now, after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, you know, this still applies to us. Now, we're not going to go out and destroy other people's property and we're not going to break down the idols and we're not going to go in there and cause destruction. You know, that's the Bible tells us that we need to be subject to the higher powers, but the highest power is God. And so in our home, if we go back to Joshua, you know, for, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so in our homes, we should be cognizant. We should be aware of the things that we need to bring down. We shouldn't have any influence from the outside world. We shouldn't have anything that could be perceived as idol worship or that could be perceived as the occult or just worldly in a general sense. And, and sometimes the world might think, oh, well, that's real innocent or, or that little, uh, you know, comic book is innocent or that comic toy or, or whatever it is. And I'm using that as an example because that seems to be prevalent in homes. You know, people buy, you know, little comic action figures, uh, you know, grown men, my age now are obsessed with these things, but that's a form of idol worship. That's a graven image. We should break stuff like that down. And let's keep reading there in uh, verse number six of Deuteron uh, Deuteronomy 12. It says, And thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heave offering of your hands and your vows and your freewill offerings and the firstling of your herd and of your flock. And there ye shall eat before the Lord your God and ye shall rejoice in all that you put your hand unto, ye and your household wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Now, if we read later on, we'll see here in 1 Corinthians, there are several passages in Mark and Luke and, and even uh, in the Old Testament where God tells us what, how we should apply that. But here, let's just keep reading. It says, ye shall not do after all these things that we, that, uh, we wherein the, the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. Ye shall not do after all the things that... We do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. So I, I like that part right there. Let's focus. It says, And ye shall rejoice in all you put, verse 7, And there ye shall eat before the Lord your God, and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand unto, ye and your household, wherein the Lord hath blessed thee. But you see there, verse 8, he says, Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day, every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. He's saying, look, you guys are off the beaten path and you're doing what you think is right in your own eyes. You need to stop that because you're not going to be able to get that blessing. You're not going to be able to rejoice in the Lord and everything that you put your hand in. See, you can't rejoice in the Lord if you put your hands and you put your work in the, raw, uh, in the wrong type of activity. If you have a purpose that has no purpose, if you're doing the things of the world, if you're laying up treasures here on earth instead of in heaven. Let's read up. Uh, uh, verse 9, it says, For ye are not as yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. But when you go over to Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord God giveth you to inherit, and when he giveth you rest from all your enemies round about, so that ye dwell in safety, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither ye shall bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, and the heave offering of your hand, and all your choice vows that ye vow unto the Lord. Now let's stop there real quick, and let's just apply this to, you know, uh, the new covenant. This still applies, he says, then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. In other words, you know, when you come to church, 
when you bless your home, when you bless your family, there's certain things we need to do. And he says, obviously, we're not going to bring our vows and we're not going to be doing the, the, the feast. But, you know, some of, some of this still applies, you know, bring uh, thither all that I command you. You know, the Lord says to give everything to him. It says uh, your burnt offerings. Well, we're not doing burnt offerings. Your sacrifices. Well, I mean, we can apply the spiritual sacrifice, the sacrifices of our lives for the Lord. Right. Uh, your tithes. Tithes are still important today. We should be tithing uh, to the church, but really it's to God, right? Don't tithe so that, you know, uh, like the world that are always asking for money so that the church can have salaries and 401ks and TSAs and all. You tithe because God said that it's robbery. You tithe to the Lord because that's your duty to bring the first fruits, right? You tithe so that you can do, do everything that you put your hand onto and you can receive that goodness of the Lord. And then, uh, you know, obviously in the heave offering of your hand and the choice vows that you vow to the Lord, obviously that, that was done away with, and that's another sermon for another day. But keep reading there, verse 12. Uh, it says, And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God. Not just you. It says, Ye, so that's us, that's you, personal, I mean uh, plural, your sons and your daughters and your men servants and your maidservants, and the Levite that is within your gates, for as much as he had no part, uh, hath no part nor inheritance with you, take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offering in every place that thou seest. I love that, that thing, and as a matter of fact, it kind of let me off on a rabbit trail, but I got back as I was preparing. And there's something we said about taking heed. You know, look up that, that term in, in, the, uh, in the Bible. And you're going to see that the Lord says take heed or take, you know, apprehend to I mean be aware of, of yourself and the things that you're doing. He says that don't just do it wherever you think is pleasant. You know, and the application for us today is take heed to ourselves, not to just go about and doing everything that we see right in our own eyes, but to do what the Lord has asked us to do. Right. One of the things that's a tall tale sign, if you're going to be rejoicing in as much as is, you know, are you rejoicing because you're partaking in Christ's suffering or are you uh, it's a fake rejoice? In other words, you think that because you did A and you got B, that the, the Lord blessed. Well, I mean, honestly, the, the Lord doesn't work like that. You know, you do A and then there's this trial and then he destroys B and then you think you're headed towards C. And then you end up on D. And I mean, that's the way that the Lord works. Remember, he told Abraham, you know, leave, leave your country. And he said, where? And he said, just go by faith. You know, he didn't give him a place. He, he was giving him the promise, the eternal promise and obviously the seed promise. But let's, let's look here. Uh, it says in verse 13, Take heed to thyself that thou not, offer, uh, not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest, but in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. In other words, when, how do we take heed to ourselves? By looking at what the Lord has commanded us to do. See, we don't just pick and choose to go to the church we think is best for us, or we pick up the Bible that we think is the easiest for us to read, which is a lie. We read the King James uh, version of the Bible. We read the King James Bible. We go to a church that preaches the truth, that has hard preaching, and that is willing to stand on God's promises regardless of the outcome, right? It says there in verse 15, it says, Notwithstanding that thou mayest kill and eat flesh in all thy gates, whatsoever thy soul lusteth, after according to the blessing of the Lord thy God which he hath given thee, the unclean and the clean may eat thereof, as a roebuck and as a heart. Only ye shall not eat of the blood, ye shall pour it on the earth as water. Thou mayest not eat within the gates the tithe of thy corn, or of thy wine, or of thy oil, or of the firstlings of thy herd, or of thy flock, nor any of thy vows which thou vowest, nor thy freewill offering, or heave offering of thy hand. But thou must eat them before the Lord thy God, in the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. Thou and thy son, and thy daughter, and thy manservant, and thy maidservant, and thy Levite was in the gates. And thou shalt rejoice before the Lord thy God in all that thou puttest thy hand unto. And so you rejoice when you're obedient to Christ. So you don't want to do like Saul, who got taken by the people, and so he decided to sacrifice before Samuel showed up on the scene because he was influenced by man's word. You know, you stand even when it's not popular, and even 
when it looks like you're the only one that that seems to not understand what's going on. Sometimes, you know, going against the tide is because you're going with God's word because, you know, the popular vote is not God's word for the most part. As a matter of fact, you know, it could be said that if you're dealing with a, making a choice and it's popular vote versus God's word, chances are they're not going to line up. You know, you're either going to have to choose God's word or the popular vote. I mean, it's very rare, very rare in life. And I can't even think of an example right now where someone says, yeah, this is the popular vote. And it lines up with God's word. As a matter of fact, most of the time, if somebody says, this is what everybody says we should do, I would, before even looking at God's word, I'd probably start walking in a different direction. Then look at God's word just to verify it. But I mean, that's just, that's just the nature of life. You know, and so whatever you're going to put your hand onto, whether you're going to follow a group of individuals, whether you're going to uh, decide to work side by side with uh another ministry or another church or the congregation, make sure that it's in obedience to God. Because if not, you will not be able to rejoice in as much as what you're putting. Uh, and to go to uh, 1 Corinthians 10, while you're there in 1 Corinthians 10, I'm going to read for you Luke 10, 27. And he answering said, and obviously we see this uh, two or three times in the Gospels, and uh, we see this in the Old Testament, but I, I just picked this one because uh, it, it, it entailed everything. But Jesus answered when the Pharisees are, are coming at him. He says, thou shall love, when they asked him what's the greatest commandment, he said, thou shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind and thy neighbor as thyself. So rejoice in as much as your hands put onto. Well, if you don't have a good barometer, if you don't have a good uh, set of instructions, well, then just memorize Luke 10, 27. That way you know that you shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and then thy neighbor as thyself. I mean, that's a real easy formula for you to follow. Go to 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. It says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. The reason I remember in, in Deuteronomy 12, 13, he says, take heed to thyself and don't just do it wherever you see fit. He says, wherefore, if you think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Go thy, um, and I'm um, sorry, I should have had you, I got ahead of myself. Go to Ecclesiastes 9. First Corinthians, uh, I was just going to read you that one verse. Go to Ecclesiastes 9. I put them all together and got myself confused. That's why it's good to have the Word of God, because as men, we're going to make mistakes. But God's Word is pure and perfect. You know. So Ecclesiastes 9, verse 7, what is it saying about putting, every, you know, putting your hand onto something? It says, Go thy way, eat the bread with joy, and drink thy wine with a merry heart. For God now accepteth thy works. Let thy garments always be white, and let thy head lack no ointment. Live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life of thy vanity, which he hath given thee under the sun all the days of thy vanity. For that is thy portion in this life and in thy labor, which thou takest under the sun. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou goest. And obviously, if you read verse 7, it says, for God now accepteth thy works. So he says, look, hey, if, you've, if God's accepted your work, if you've put your heart, your soul, your strength, your mind into it, and you love your neighbors thyself, hey, there's whatsoever thy hand, do it, uh, do it with thy might and enjoy it. Enjoy your wife. Enjoy the labor of your life if you're doing it for these things. I mean, God doesn't want us to be, you know, these uh, mopey, uh, poor little old me people, you know, they have the plum syndrome. Uh, poor little old me and they're, they're walking around and woe is me and how difficult life is. Uh, you know, he just doesn't want you to put, lay up your treasures here on earth. I mean, we're not taking a vow of poverty. We're not taking a vow of suffering. We're not taking a vow of, of these, you know, wicked uh, works-based uh, sacrifices. You know, if you sacrifice for the Lord because you feel led by the Lord to do so, there's that, that's a different thing than if you're just sacrificing to be seen of men and maybe of the Lord so that people can say, oh, look at him. Look how much he sacrifices. Look how good of a person he is. Look how hard he works. I mean, that, think about the Catholics. You know, they, they tell their priest or their whatever, 
not to marry because then they can focus everything on the Lord and, you know, I won't be distracted by the things. But what does the Bible say? You know, it is better to marry than to burn. And then, it, you know, it's really the exception, not the rule, that there's people that go through, uh, through their life uh, being uh, celibate and never getting married and just focusing on the Lord. For the most part, we need a good wife. Even the bishop, it says, be the husband of one wife. So it's not an exception uh, for the bishop. It's not an exception for the elder. It's something that we, we need to put our mind, we need to put our might. And if, and if you read in Proverbs, I didn't bring that up, but you know, the Bible tells us a lot of things to rejoice over. And one of the things it says, rejoice in, thy, in the wife of thy youth. It says, rejoice at his birth. Rejoice in his salvation. Rejoice in his creation. I mean, there's a lot of things that we rejoice, but we have to have it in the proper context. Let's go to point number three. Rejoice in as much as every good thing which he has given you. You know, every good thing which he has given you. So, you know, it's all his goodness, everything you put your hand into, and then what he gives you. And this, this uh, specifically is talking about tithing. And this is not a tithing sermon, but there's a lot to be said about the first fruits go to God. And honestly, I mean, if you really think about life, we should just give everything we can to God. You know, to the point where, you know, my prayer is that at, at some point we can just give it all to God. Because where does it all come from? God. You know, nothing comes by our doing. We're not so smart to think that any business deal or anything that we created, we, we were smart enough that, you know, I, I think it's always funny when I hear people say, well, I, 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 may, I, you know, I got myself up by my strap boots, you know, by myself. Nobody ever helped me out. That's not true. Somebody helped you out. Maybe not directly, but you didn't get to where you were without somebody helping you out. Well, guess what? If you really follow that line all the way up, Everything comes from God, the, uh, the creator of everything. So let's go there to Deuteronomy 26, and then we're going to be in Psalm 9. Deuteronomy 26, and then we'll be in Psalm 9. We're at point number three, rejoicing as much as every good thing which he has given you. And speci specifically, this is going to be talking about tithing, but just everything, right? Deuteronomy 26, and the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm and with great terribleness and with signs and with wonders. And he hath brought us into this place and hath given us this land, even the land that floweth with milk and honey. So the Lord's given them. The Lord's keeping his promise. It says, And now, behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which thou, O Lord, hast given me, and thou shalt set it before the Lord thy God and worship before the Lord thy God. And thou shalt rejoice in every good thing which the Lord thy God hath given unto thee and unto thine house, thou and the Levite and the stranger that is among the way. So now we're bringing everything and we're going to rejoice in every good thing. Well, one good way to rejoice is to bring the first fruits, is to tithe our time and our efforts. And obviously, tithing speaking specifically, let's not belabor the point about money as well. It says, when thou has made an end of tithing all the tithes of thy increase. Notice the word there is increase the third year, which is the year of tithing as given it unto the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, that they may eat within the gates and be filled. Then thou shalt say before the Lord thy God, I have brought away the hallowed things out of mine house and also given them unto the Levite, unto the stranger, to the fatherless, and to the widow, according to all thy commandments which thou, ha which thou hast commanded me. I have not trans transgressed thy commandment, neither have I forgotten them. So God wants us to follow the commandments, but he also wants us to bring the first fruits. And then what should we do with the first fruits? We, what should we do with our tithing? We should take care, obviously, of, of the house of God, the Levites, you know, the 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 elders and the church and the things that they need to do there in the church. But he says also to the fatherless and to the widows and according to all that thou hast commanded. See, I mean, there's churches that worry more about relocating their entire congregation. In the last year, I've seen two churches, Baptist churches, that have people worshiping in their gyms because they've had this big raising of money to redo the entire building. Well, let me just tell you something. So when it doesn't get done in the buildings, you know, you know neither, neither does missions work. Uh, you know, and I'm not against a clean, decent looking building. There's nothing, in my opinion, fruitful about a, 
glorious, you know, uh, overdone building, it's just not going to do anything. You know, I mean, Solomon built the temple for God. That's the only time that I see God really putting his hands on it. But other than that, you know, what's the point of having a huge building if your ministry is dying? You know, just down the road, Pastor Cobb was telling me that there's a church down the road that's actually pretty big, Clay Baptist, and they're holding on for dear life because I'm pretty sure they're more focused about the things of this world than the things of, you know, heavenly things. Let's go to point number four. So what do we do? As it, we, we rejoice in as much as every good thing which He has given you. And one of the ways to rejoice is to just give back. God loves a cheerful giver. And I'm not just talking about tithing. I'm talking about just giving. Giving of your time. Giving of your effort. Giving of your spirit. Giving of your work. Giving of your uh, removing that selfishness and becoming unselfish. You know, the Bible tells us to bear you one another's burdens. To, to go out there and care for your neighbors. To love your enemies. He wants us to hate those that hate God, but not hate our enemies. Go to Psalm 9. Rejoice in as much as He is our salvation. You know, the Bible speaks a lot in Psalms about our salvation. Let's go there to Psalm. And, you know, I didn't, I, I only picked, you know, two Psalms, Psalms 9 and, and Psalms 13. But if you go there, it says in verse 1, it says, To the chief music musician upon Muthlaban, a psalm of David, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. So there we see that whole heart again. Everything we're going to put our hands onto. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. There's that approved work that we can put our hands into and want to give back to. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. When my enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou saddest in the throne, judging right. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. This is talking about hell. This is talking about those that have rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. This is talking about those that had wanted to do nothing with that eternal gift of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It says, O thou enemy, destruction has come to a perpetual end. O thou hast destroyed cities, their memorials perished with them. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. The Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Sing praises. To the Lord which dwelleth in Zion, declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that lifted me up from the gates of death, that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughters of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. In other words, we're going through the trials. We're, we're rejoicing in Christ's suffering. We're being reproached. But you know what? I will rejoice in thy salvation because he's not forsaken us. And we know, I love that, that verse right there in Psalm 6. It says, thou, O thou enemy, destructions come to a perpetual end. In other words, you get to the end, that pit, and it's forever. It's perpetual. You know, I love that word because that was the word that, you know, was used when I first got saved. Um, the pastor that led me to the Lord told me, that now I would have perpetual rest in the Lord. It just made perfect sense to me that once saved, always saved. I mean, we were out soul winning earlier today, and I mean, I had this guy trying to just paraphrase. He wouldn't even bring it out of the Bible, just paraphrase, just butcher uh, verse after verse in Spanish about how you can lose your salvation, how you can lose your salvation. And I told him, you know, at the end, I just, you know, admonish a heretic once or twice, right? And then you move on. And I told him once, I he wouldn't let me, I mean, I was taking him to verses like Romans 4 or 5, and I took him to Ephesians, he wasn't listening. Finally, I told him, you know what? It's just arrogant of you, just arrogant and pompous to think that you can pluck yourself out of the Lord's hand. I mean, the Lord is your salvation. It's not the other way around. It's not like you can get in, and then you're like, you know what? I reject, and I'm, I'm going to get out. Once you're in, you're in. You know, we're sinners. It says, and while you were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yet is an active, you know, 
it, it's, it's happening. Not you might have, you, you, were, you sinned, but you no longer sin. You were yet sinners. Let's go to the final point. Go to Matthew. Go to Matthew uh, 5. Go to Matthew 5. And we now get to the, 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 the part of the sermon that's based on 1 Peter 4, uh, 13. Rejoicing as much as we partake in Christ's suffering. You know, Matthew 5, verse 1 says, And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and he was set. His disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. You know, when I was young and they preached the Beatitudes, and this is not a Beatitude message, but none of this really ever made sense. It's not until you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you realize that the world's going to hate you because you love the Lord, that you realize these attributes fit perfectly. I mean, you mourn for people. You know, uh, you, you, you want to be meek. Because the Bible tells us you don't want to be out there, be pompous, be arrogant, be haughty. It says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. How do we hunger and thirst for righteousness? We go to church, we read our Bibles, we pray. And you know what's, what, what uh, helps me hunger and thirst for righteousness a lot? So winning. I mean, there's nothing greater than going out soul winning. I mean, you just, you're getting so much word every time you preach it. You get to see those souls saved. You get to see that the battle's real. You get to see that uh, if you're not prepared for the day of battle, you need to go back and sharpen that, that sword, you know, sharpen that edge, and you need to get on that full armor of God. But you can't do that unless you're out in the battlefield. You know, uh, they train warriors. Because the day of battle is different than when you're out there. You need to be prepared for everything that comes your way. And one of the things that you do is you have mock battles or mock uh, you know, fights. This is what, what you hunger and you thirst. You do all these things, for they should be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And then we see here, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How do we partake in? We're blessed if we're persecuted for righteousness. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. In other words, men will revile you. You know, when you revile someone, you just, you hate them. You just, you want to just tear them apart. It says, and persecute they come after you with everything they've got, and they, shall, and they shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. You know, one of the things that's come out of this uh, sad situation is that you see those that hate the Lord. And I'm talking about, you know, this pastor, uh, this former pastor in, uh, in Fort Worth, Texas, that uh, partook in uh, wicked sin. And now the world's trying to take advantage because he preached hard uh, hard truths. You know what? That's not going to deter us that preach hard truths from preaching them. That's not going to, as a matter of fact, if anything, it's strengthened our resolve. And the other thing is it's strengthened our examination of ourselves so that we don't, we take heed to ourselves lest we fall. And uh, let's look at verse 12. It says, Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were, were before you. So after all of this, God says, look, after all this blessing, rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Not small, great. And so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is then for its good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You know, if you ever shine, if you, you know, this morning my daughter, she, uh, she's two and a half, so she's learning to talk. And she says phrases, and she can actually say full sentences in, in certain respects. But, you know, they, they get things backwards, or they don't complete a full sentence uh, the way we would. And this morning, we turned on the light when she was waking up. And uh, she doesn't know how to say that the light's too bright. 
So she said, sun eyes, sun eyes, you know, the sun's in her eyes. Well, that's, that's kind of what we are when we're preaching the word of truth. We're, we're a breath of fresh air to those who, who want it and who haven't heard it, but we're kind of a blinding light to those who hate God. You know, but it's not for us to decide where we shine our light. We just let our, shine, our light shine, and God's going to point us in the direction where we need to light. Right? Go to Luke. Actually, go to John 16. I'll just read for you real quick. Luke. Luke 6, verse 20 says, And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast, uh, cast, out, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the like manner that the fathers unto the prophets. I, I think it's interesting the Bible says not only to rejoice when you're reproached, but it says to leap. You know, today, uh, I think that there are some, in some uh, divisional playoff games. I don't, I don't follow football anymore uh, to any extent. I know that the season's going. I mean, I followed football long enough to know that what part of the season we're in now. But I believe, you know, we're, pretty, we're getting pretty close to the Super Bowl. And what's going on right now is, you know, as, as people are making plays and, and they're over-dramatizing and making very poetic and romantic, what happens? You know, if, if somebody throws a, a Hail Mary and they catch it, the other guys are jumping for the team. You see these millionaires and these, you know, uh, family men and, and women and kids and people who you would never think have an extrovert bone in their body. They're jumping up and down for joy. But for us, he says, look, verse 22 says, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you. In other words, we want to be blessed and we want to like it. I want, I want the world to hate me, right? It says, and when they shall separate you from their company, and then when they say, you know what? I don't want anything to do with you. I posted a picture. I don't normally like to do that, but I just think it's great that, you know, we still have uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ that are older that can teach the younger like me and that are willing to go out and sow in. And, you know, yesterday I had a brother who was 81, and, a and uh, Pastor Cobb, who's 82, soul winning with me, and I posted a picture of it, and I just said we were soul winning. Nothing major. And uh, a guy that I know put, put on there, you know, what did you learn? And I already know where this guy stands on his beliefs. You know, he's being condescending. He's trying to, you know, maybe catch me on something stupid. I told him, you know, what I learned is that people are going to hell every day and that there's not enough laborers. But I want him to, you know, and if he takes me off and he unfriends me or tells me something, great. Bring it on. That's why I responded. Because the Bible says, And shall reproach you and cast, you, uh, cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sakes. Rejoice in the name and leap for joy. In other words, the Bible says leap. Have you ever seen those guys? They get all into it. Yeah. You know, I, I'm, my dad thought it was really, uh, he hated watching sports with me. Because, I mean, I'm, I was hardcore. I'm one of those... You know, I'd be watching the, the three-point, and I'm, I'm waiting for it. I'm like, three-pointer, baby, three-pointer, three-pointer. Yeah, you have three-pointer. <laughs> but, you know, that was when you were in the world. But that's what God wants you to do now for being reproached. You know, so when someone hates you, walk out. Walk with your head out high and be like, you know what? That's okay. You know, that heretic that attacked me today thinking that it's, you know, work salvation? Good. I should have just jumped up in his face for joy. That guy that told me that, you know, they believed in a pre-tribulation chapter, but that, uh, you know, he agreed with after the tribulation because that's God's, uh, Jesus' second coming because they, they, they're disp dispensationalists. You know, I should, I, it's okay when he rejected me. I should just jump for joy. And I, I got so excited, I, uh, I dropped the waters and stuff over here. Luckily, they were closed. But that's what the Bible's telling us. It says, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. Go to John 16, verse 19. Go to John 16, verse 19, and then we'll wrap this up. We'll close out with this set of verses. I mean, actually, uh, in, ver in Acts, we're going to go to John, and then we're going to be in Acts 5. It says, John 16, 19 says, Now Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him and said unto them, Do ye inquire among yourselves of that I said, A little while, and ye shall not see me, and again a little while, and ye shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice. So this is an example where we see the word rejoice twice. We're going to see the negative application, and then we're going to see the positive. See, the world is happy when they think 
that you're lamenting and weeping because they came after you. But the reality is they don't realize that we're weeping and lamenting because we see the souls that are going to hell. We see those that are suffering. We see the wickedness of this world. We see those, you know, those families being destroyed. We see babies being murdered. We see babies and children being abused. We see all kinds of unnatural use of the natural use of men and women. We see all the wickedness in the world and we weep and we lament, but the world shall rejoice and you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. A woman, a woman when she's in travail, remember I asked you to look, to you know, just keep your finger there to remember. If we go back to uh, Exodus 18, verse 8, it says, And Moses told his father-in-law that the Lord had done unto Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, and all the travail that had come upon them by the way, and how the Lord delivered them, and Jeth Jethro rejoiced. Well, we see here another example. A woman, when she is in travail, hath sorrow, because her hour has come. But as soon as she is delivered out of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. And in that day ye shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall ask of my Father in my name, he will give, you, give it to you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full, or that you can rejoice. You know, go to Acts 5, and we'll close out with that. You know, the Bible tells us and gives us examples. And I, I wanted to give example after example after example, but honestly, this is a, a great study. I, I encourage anybody to just do this, because, you know, one of the things is, uh, we got to preach the entire word. And, it, and this is a different approach. You know, you're going to go to these uh, feel-good churches and they tell you to be happy for all the wrong reasons. And they tell you to find joy in all the wrong things. Right? And they, uh, they don't even preach correctly. You know, and they tell us to love everybody and not hate and be inclusive. You know, that's actually really frustrating because that's not the natural way of life. Right? You know, have you ever just uh, eaten a food that you just... When I was young... I used to love salami, uh, you know, and, and uh, I would eat it in my sandwiches, and I just, I mean, I loved it. But I remember it was like in fir first grade, I'll still remember like it was today. I ate a piece, and it just didn't sit well with me, and, and then I threw up, and I got sick, and I don't know that I've ever eaten salami ever since then. I mean, I, th I think it's been 30 years or plus that I, I mean, I hate it. Even the smell of it just, just makes me queasy. Because your body just rejected it. And so it's natural to want to hate things, you know. And as I've grown in God's word, you know what I hate? I hate sin. But I don't just hate sin. I hate the sinner too. The, the man and woman or child who's partaking in that sin. You know, I'm not going to take Gandhi's position and just hate the sin. Guess what? Somebody's committing that sin. There's certain things that I hate that I don't want to do. But one of the things that I love because I love when people, you know, my parents uh, tell me all the time that I'm a real contentious. And I, I, I don't really think I am. I'm not, you know, let everybody speak, let somebody else speak of you. But what I mean by this, is what I mean by I'm not, is I just like preaching the truth. And so sometimes people ask me questions in front of them. I don't know if it's them egging them on or if it's me egging them on. But every once in a while, people will ask me around my parents, you know, oh, so you think if I don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to hell? I'm like, well, absolutely, you know, and from what the sound of it, it sounds like you're going to hell. Now, I don't think that's contentious because I think that that's my duty to tell them the truth. You know, they have a cancer, an eternal cancer, and maybe somebody should do something about it, right? They should pluck it out. They should cut it out, but nobody's willing because they don't want to hurt them. You know, I remember when I was little, my dad never seemed to have a problem uh, with giving me an injection or some kind of procedure. My dad's a doctor, and so I grew up around medicine. And I remember sometimes, you know, he'd come home and he's like, okay, this is going to hurt, but it's for your own good. Well, you know what? God says, this is going to hurt, but it's for your own good. It's not only that we preach the word and, and we tell everybody the truth, but we also have to be willing to deal with the consequences that come from that. God says, these are your consequences. This is the cause and effect. If you believe in me and you want to preach my word, that's the cause. And the effect is that the world will hate you and they will revile you and they will persecute you. And he says, rejoice 
and leap. And I don't want to leap high anymore because I think I almost I, I moved. I think I moved this out. It's uncentered or whatever. But go to Acts 5:40. We see an example. It says, "And to him they agreed." And this is at the end of the chapter in verse 40. You know, and they, they've taken uh, the apostles uh, in a prison, or they've ta they've taken them in for questioning. And they've kind of told them, don't preach the word. And basically, they're going to let them loose. But here's what happens when they're letting them loose. It says, and they agreed to let them loose is basically what you're seeing here. And when they called, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they didn't just agree, you know, and we see this today where people might not want to fellowship with you, but all, along the way of kicking you out of church, or their group of belief systems, they're also going to try to besmirch your name and drag you through the mud. And then, you know, even in a, in a police uh, settings or settings of authority, you see that where they might let someone go, but before that, you know, you might get taken down, you might get beat up, you might get hurt. But if you're doing it for Christ's name, then it's worth it. If you're doing it for any other, th if any other reason, then it's just stupid, plain stupid. It says there, and they departed in verse 41, and verse 41, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. In other words, boom, here comes the attack. Here comes the, the, the cold shoulder, the cut off in communication, the, the bad name, the insults, the the beat-ups, the whatever, the calling the cops. And then they left, and they're excited, they're rejoicing, and they counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And then what did they do? And daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. I mean, where is our rejoicing? Rejoicing as much as. Well, how do we get to, to this? Well, let's just review real quick, and we'll close out. Rejoicing as much as the Lord's goodness is towards us. And rejoice in as much as you're able to put your hand unto everything that the Lord asks you to do. And put it towards the Lord, right? Rejoice is, uh, in every good thing which He has given you and let Him know. Let the Lord know you rejoice in that. Rejoice in He is our salvation. And then ultimately rejoice as we are partakers in Christ's suffering. I mean, there's nothing greater than to suffer for Christ. What's great is, you know, in the same way, weekend where I had family over, and I'm not going to go into specifics of the family just because I don't know who's going to watch what, but we kicked out some Jehovah's Witnesses over Christmas and rebuked them, but in the same thing, then we talked about some harder doctrines, and then we've got chastised and we got rebuked by, by those family members that we love. But you know what? We didn't take offense to it. We got excited, my wife and I, and we're like, you know what? We're going to get into the Word more, and, and we're going to learn these doctrines even better, and guess what? Not only those, but we're going to learn even harder doctrines. So the next time these conversations come up, we can even be harder on them. And then they can reject us even harder and more because it's exciting to stand for Christ. So let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you for the opportunity to preach a message like this. And Lord, help us to rejoice and to leap for joy. And the only way we're going to be able to rejoice and leap for joy is if we're out there doing your work. And by consequence of doing your work, people are going to get mad. People are going to hate us. And they're going to revile us and persecute us. And when that time comes, Lord, because it will come, help us to reflect and to look and to be rejoiceful and to leap for joy for the things that you've allowed us to do so that we can reap our rewards in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.